Welcome to Capital Link's company presentation series. Welcome to Capital Link's corporate presentation webinar series. In this series, senior management of listed companies provide an update on their operations, business development, uh, strategy, and sector outlook. I'm Nicholas Bornois, president of Capital Link, and Capital Link is an investor relations firm also active in event and conference organization. We work with several private and publicly listed companies, including companies featured in uh, this webinar series. As noted in our disclaimer, these presentations are purely for informational and educational purposes. They do not constitute investment advice or advice of any kind, and evidently Capital Link bears no responsibility for them. Today, we are privileged to have with us the senior management of uh, Dorian LPG. We have with us Mr. John Likouris, CEO of uh, Dorian LPG USA, and Mr. Ted Young, CFO. Uh, the whole session is going to last 45 minutes. We will start with a brief slide presentation, followed by a live Q&A. Uh, please submit your questions anytime during uh, the session uh, through the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, please uh, include your company and, na and name. Uh, alternatively, you can email your questions to us at webinars at capitallink.com and we will uh, address them to the panelists. So thank you for joining us. I'm turning the floor over to uh, Ted and John. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, and uh, good morning to everyone. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we're really thrilled to have the opportunity to uh, have this great outreach and to tell you about Dorian LPG. Uh, briefly, the usual uh, forward-looking statements disclaimer. Uh, we just released earnings last week, so uh, uh, everything's out there at this point, but again, we we'll, may make some forward-looking statements today. Um, to give you a brief overview of Dorian, we are a uh, New York Stock Exchange listed owner and operator of very large gas carriers. Uh, we'll get into uh, what that all means in a second. We uh, transport LPG, which is propane and butane, uh, around the world. Uh, we are headquartered in Stanford, Connecticut, where John and I sit, as well as our chairman, uh, John Hajibateris. We do our commercial operations from Copenhagen and our technical operations from Athens. And we have a major joint venture presence in Singapore with uh, uh, Mitsui OSK's Phoenix Tanker business. So we're, we're globally represented. And I would point out that all of our activities are through wholly owned subsidiaries. That, so our in, uh, interests are totally aligned with our investors. Um, in terms of our fleet, you can see we've got quite a young fleet, uh, and with, uh, and, and with uh, the fleet under management and on the water, we are the second largest player in the sector. Uh, you'll note that we've got 13 uh, scrubber fitted ships. We think that's very important, and we'll get into that a bit later. Um, and uh, also our fleet's quite young, which uh, for those of you invest in the shipping sector uh, know is quite important. So briefly, we thought we'd step back because maybe not all of our attendees today are familiar with, uh, with, with uh, LPG. So quickly, LPG, it is a fossil fuel, but it is a lot, uh, has, has some wonderful green characteristics uh, compared to some of the alternatives. It is a byproduct of oil and natural gas production. Um, and as one of our competitors was fond of saying, no one has ever produced a metric ton of LPG on purpose. So it's a byproduct. Uh, as long as there's uh, production of, of uh, natural gas and oil, we'll continue to have LPG production. Um, where is it used? Uh, mostly it's used at home. Uh, about 55% of global uh, consumption is used for heating and cooking. Um, and another major end market is the petrochemical sector. Um, as I just touched on why, it's cleaner than oil and it's a great alternative to gasoline. It generates less air pollution and fewer emissions of CO2, um, and also uh, pretty favorable in terms of particulate emissions, which is of course very important as well. To look at uh, sort of the global supply chain in a quick snapshot, uh, we've touched on the production piece. VLGCs, as you can see, are the key linchpin. Um, the vast majority of LPG production uh, comes out of the United States with the Middle East as a trading block second. And uh, the major consumer areas are in the Far East, so uh, China, India, Korea, Japan. And we'll give you some more detail on that. In terms of end markets, as we talked about, um, 
you know, one way we look at it is to break it up between retail and bulk. Um, of that retail 60%, about 90% of that goes into the cooking and heating. Uh, those of you in the US are quite familiar with uh, the canisters that uh, we use to fire our grills, uh, pool heating, um, all sorts of other sort of domestic applications, commercial applications. Uh, auto gas is a bit uh, of a bit player at this point, but we do expect to see growth in that for all the uh, environmental reasons that we've seen. Um, chemical of the next segment is probably responsible for about 70% of that 40%. So about 28% of, of global consumption goes into the petrochemical sector. Um, and in the petrochemical sector, it is a, used as a feedstock uh, for steam crackers to produce uh, mostly propylene and a bit of ethylene, which are both building blocks in the plastics chain. The, um, so, in, in, and there's a, there's a trade-off there for steam crackers versus naphtha, but uh, there's also a new uh, way of producing uh, propylene called propane dehydrogenation, which is an on-purpose direct way of making it, and there's no competition from naphtha, and I'll get into that in a second. Um, so we often get asked, obviously, well, what's the driver of freight rates? And a major driver of freight weight rates is the east-west arbitrage. So that is the sale price. Typically, we look at it uh, from uh, Mount Bellevue in the United States. Uh, we have to look at the terminaling cost in the U.S., and then we look at the landed cost in, uh, in the Far East. So uh, that yellow block is what's uh, available in terms of freight. And uh, you can see that generally the, the, the freight expands to fill the profit allotted. And uh, so, you know, it's it, the profit that our customers are making is an important piece of the puzzle, as well as the availability of ships, of course. So there are times if we roll back this chart that, um, you know, shipping was taking the vast majority of the, uh, the profit that's available because there just weren't enough ships. If you look back to 2014 and 2015, um, and if you look, if you look now, uh, it's a pretty good freight environment. Uh, it's come off a little bit in the last few weeks, but um, pretty healthy. Again, a good combination of steady demand growth and uh, somewhat tight availability of ships. So that's a big part of, our, of the driver of freight rates. And the other piece uh, that I touched on is the um, propane naphtha spread. So you can see on the left side, we pointed out that we expect to see continued growth in steam cracker uh, capacity in Asia. So steam crackers take some naphtha or take a lot of naphtha, but when naphtha is expensive relative to LPG, the, uh, the producers switch over and will substitute LPG for part of the feedstock. Now, they don't do it overnight. Uh, it's about a nine month payback. So they have to be pretty convinced of the duration of the, of the uh, savings. And you can see here uh, on the right side, sort of how that spread is, is uh, evolved over time. And typically when we see it in excess of um, $60 a metric ton, uh, we tend to see pretty good rates. And so it's not surprising that in the latter part of 2018, uh, 2019, uh, and even 2020, even though the, the, it didn't uh, help us too much, uh, we're, we're pretty good. You know, we didn't get quite as much help in 2021 from, uh, from NAPFA but uh, we're starting to get some benefit again this year. So um, it's an interesting part. And again, it's about 28% of, of global LPG consumption. So that's the piece that probably adds a little bit of um, volatility to, uh, to, to freight rates in our world. Turning a little bit to, um, again, back to the supply chain. Um, you know, the US is again, um, extremely, extremely important supplier of uh, product to the world. You can see that uh, in spite of what's gone on with COVID, uh, Far Eastern imports have remained pretty steady, um, you know, still about 46, 48% of world demand. And again, that's been the usual combination for us of uh, increased uh, uh, consumer uh, demand because people have been uh, locked down, obviously. And uh, we've seen some, uh, you know, pretty steady growth among the PDH guys because uh, the industrial activity in, in China did not just completely shut down. So again, that's been helpful to our business, as you can imagine. If you look at the bottom slide, you can really see pretty clearly um, how the U.S. has increased its uh, shipments to China over time. The blip that you'll see in 2018 and 19 was, of course, the imposition of the Trump administration tariffs. Um, 
those those weren't reversed until after the Biden administration took office. But in 2020, you see that big snapback. That was because the um, Chinese started granting uh, certain waivers and the U.S. started making things a bit easier. And so there was uh, more demand, um, more product available to be shipped to China. So you saw China sort of rebound. I note that during that time period, when we weren't shipping as much to China, it didn't really change the dynamics of our trade. It simply meant that uh, from the US, we were servicing um, maybe Korea and Japan, which were traditional markets anyway. And, uh, and uh, you know, the, uh, the China was getting served out of the Middle East. So, you know, it was probably a slight increase in ton miles net net. But, um, you know, there were plenty of other things going on, but it does show the importance of the global nature of the LPG trade and, uh, and, and, and you know, how being globally represented as we are is, is pretty key to um, being an, a, an active and profitable player in the sector. Um, again, you can see here that um, we obviously suffered a dip during 2020, but it wasn't a big one. And uh, now with 2021 in the, in the rear view mirror, we're above pre-pandemic levels. And as you can see on the lower left-hand side, the, uh, the U.S. Uh, has really, you know, continued to, to be the economic or, or the LPG growth engine, um, as, you, as you'd uh, expect, given all the uh, benefits we've had from the fracking uh, revolution. And even with the decline in rig counts and everything else, productivity has gone up by rigs. So we're still seeing continued steady growth. And of course, there's really good pull through demand on the other side. Um, on the other side of the ledger, the, the Arabian Gulf, uh, you can see what's happened to exports there. Uh, some of that decline has really been a function of Saudi Arabia's more or less strategic decision to uh, keep more of its LPG for domestic use, particularly in the large Sabic plastics plant they have there. Um, but we've also seen uh, Kuwait step up a little bit and Abu Dhabi step up a little bit. So there is sort of more going on beneath the headline numbers than just Saudi Arabia pulling back. But again, we think it remains a, a, a very vibrant and, uh, and profitable trade. Um, again, the, we, we showed you before where the LPG was going to, and, and here you can see where it's coming from. And you can see um, really from you know, 2018 to 2020 is when the US overtook the Middle East as a trading block. And that was obviously pretty momentous uh, for the United States. We've, um, it, there's an interesting dynamic <clears throat> that, uh, that, that drives the growth of the US. It's not just the availability of the product, which of course is paramount, but uh, our pricing mechanism coming out of the US is far more transparent. Um, Mount Bellevue is a posted price. Uh, for those of you who pay for the right subscription on Bloomberg, you can see it every day. Um, whereas in, in uh, Saudi is based on a posted contract price. The Saudis post every month. Um, and it's really dependent on, on, on drivers that um, usually are only known to them. A lot of people spend time prognosticating. Sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. But the interesting thing about it is um, historically, Saudi has provided a nice price umbrella vis-a-vis uh, -vis the U.S. So if you look at it sort of right now, Saudi propane is probably about $100 a metric ton, 100 plus more expensive than uh, the exact same product coming out of the U.S., uh, similar with butane. And so as a result, you know, obviously it becomes the preferred supplier to the U.S. becomes, in, in addition to its volumes, the price makes it a preferred supplier to the world and, and traders can make more money because both both the end markets are ultimately priced on the FEI, the Far East Index, which is a price put together by Argus. Um, and uh, that's the reference price in, in, in Asia. So with the US being cheaper, even with the slightly longer sailing times, although again, those aren't even that much different with the advent of the Panama Canal, um, the US has proved to be a profitable uh, source market for the LPG traders out there. Um, Looking at, you know, one of the key drivers is, are we going to have enough uh, fractionation capacity here in the U.S.? Uh, fractionation capacity, as a reminder, is the process of taking uh, what's called Y-grade, which is the stuff that comes out of the ground, and splitting it into its component parts, uh, propane, butane, natural gasoline, ethane, whatever else. So um, as you can see, um, you know, the U.S. has done a nice job of, you know, steadily growing its um, it, it's fractionation capacity and meat demand. It hasn't been a bottleneck and we don't expect to, 
you know, that to be any problem going forward. Um, here, we just wanted to share some statistics with you on where US production levels are. And obviously you can see here, as we look out in 2022, um, we're at the high end of the, of the five-year average. And at the same time, we're at the low end of, of inventories of the five-year average. So obviously we think that sets up fairly well for um, strong export demand. Um, while there, there, we would expect to see, as you can see here, inventories will continue to be drawn down through the, through the spring. And then they start building up over uh, here through the summer. Um, and then late in the summer, early fall, <clears throat> the Asian market starts uh, rebuilding for the Northern hemisphere winter. So that's, that's sort of the dynamic we see at play. But again, we think the fundamentals in the LPG world set up pretty well for us right now. Um, again, turning to, to export capacity, which is closely sort of related to the fractionation uh, capacity that I touched on. You can see here that again, the U.S. has made significant investments in its export capacity, and we're comfortably ahead of, of, of um, you know, of, of, of any levels that, uh, you know, of the, uh, of, uh, of, of reaching a bottleneck is what I'm trying to get at. So you can see there, there's been good growth. And I think one of the key things that we feel very good about is that the guys behind these investments um, are what uh, I think the street calls smart money. Guys like Enterprise, Targa, um, these are large, sophisticated companies that uh, have very nice businesses. So they really don't take the risk of building fra uh, of export capacity on spec. Uh, it's really based on either firm contracts or very high levels of comfort on what the uh, what the growth is going to be. So again, um, with only seventy six percent utilization, currently things things look good. And again, we think that. Uh, you know, as we understand it, LPG continues to be a very important part of the midstream producers playbook. And so again, we expect to play right along with that and, and, and benefit uh, from that. I touched a little bit on um, some of the export markets. China, very important market for us. Um, again, uh, you can see what's, we, we've, we've shared some of the statistics with you. And I think what's most interesting is the increasing demand from these new propane dehydrogenation projects. Again, um, we do see some data on the gross margins of these products and they generate pretty darn good returns. And so as a result, um, you know, there's been steady investment. They haven't yet spoiled the party, but, um, you know, we keep an eye on it. But again, they seem to be pretty steady off takers of propane. And again, it goes into the plastics chain. So as long as China is continuing to produce um, a wide variety of products, whether it be iPhones or televisions or anything else, uh, plastics continue to go into that. So LPG is you know, certainly a part of the plastic supply chain and particularly in China. Um, India, is a, India is also a, a real success story. Um, the government has gotten behind uh, subsidizing uh, based on income, it's a scaled subsidy to support uh, LPG consumption in India. Uh, it's been, the UN has gotten behind it. So we've seen significant increase in the number of households that are being served by LPG. It's, uh, you know, it's great to see because we're seeing people's lives improved, uh, their quality of life, their health improved because they're not burning biomass. They're not spending a lot of time scrounging in uh, uh, the woods or other places to find material to burn. Uh, so this has been a, a, a you know, sort of a, a great story from both a business perspective, but also from a social and environmental perspective that we've seen in India. Um, Turning a little bit to uh, our business a little more closely, spot rates. Um, most of our most of our fleet, we've got two vessels on time charter, but most of our fleet does play in the spot market. Uh, that's a significant part of uh, of the VLGC market uh, as it's grown. We have provided you here with um, a time charter equivalent per day. Note that freight, in actual fact, in our world, is quoted in metric tons. Uh, dollars per metric ton. So when our freight guy, when our chartering guys are negotiating uh, a cargo, they know what the TCE is, but the guy on the other end of the phone doesn't really care. He's focused on dollars per metric ton. So, um, you know, some, some people have uh, asked us about how to understand fluctuations in our revenue vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, fluctuations in the, in the Baltic rate. 
Well, the bolted rate is only part of the equation. When uh, bunker costs go up, that's our fuel. Um, that's a direct deduction to the time charter equivalent that uh, that we calculate and show to investors. So um, that's really, you know, there are a couple other variables, but really that's the main one. And it's important to appreciate that while we as financial people all look at the time charter equivalent per day as in dollars, uh, our customers are really looking at a gross freight number, and that's what gets negotiated every day. Um, you can, in the lower right-hand corner, we show you that fleet utilization has been pretty healthy. Um, if you look at uh, most shipping sectors, you know, the rule of thumb has always been, well, gee, if you're in the high 80s, 90s, uh, that's usually a really good freight environment. And you can see here that, uh, you know, we've continued to enjoy a, a pretty good freight environment here for the last, um, you know, really eight quarters for the most part. So um, again, that's a function of, you know, the right balance in the shipping market, but I think very good fundamental pull through demand for a product that we think is increasingly important for not just heating and cooking, but also for the global plastic supply chain. Um, here's some information on the, uh, the order book. Uh, clearly we have uh, quite a bit of volume coming in next year, um, but we, we would point out that, you know, we're seeing a lot of ships uh, aging. Um, that's 50 ships that are in the, what we call the scrapping zone. Um, we also have continued growth in our uh, trade, you know, because again, we continue to see good pull through demand and growth in, in shipping. Um, in fact, you know, given the, the growth in China uh, that we expect to see from the PDH plants alone and sort of using the rule of thumb that, um, you know, it takes uh, uh, four VLGCs to move 1 million metric tons, uh, we can see most of the order book being consumed uh, solely by, by demand coming out of China. So um, that's one piece of it uh, that we think is, is quite important. The other piece is, uh, for those of you looking at the shipping sector, you know that the, uh, there are a lot of environmental regulation changes on the horizon. And so as a result, uh, you know, that's going to that's gonna create some, uh, some slowdowns in sailing speeds, which will also create some length in the fleet. So we remain fairly optimistic about our business going forward. Um, here's uh, some detail on our fleet, and you can see we've installed scrubbers. Currently, that investment's worked out great, and John will hopefully get onto that in a little bit during the Q and A. Um, we're making two to three thousand dollars a day uh, over a, uh, for, in, in some cases more, versus a, uh, a traditional ship, and so we're very happy with the investment we've made in our scrubbers. Um, the point being that again, we I, I touched on it before that freight is negotiated in dollars per metric ton. Having a younger fleet translates into real meaningful dollar savings uh, over time. And so we've kind of laid out the numbers here for your review. But again, we think having a young, fuel efficient fleet, and in many cases equipped with uh, scrubbers, allows us to have, you know, make a higher profit in given the same Baltic rate. Um, again, I, I'm, John will get onto this a bit in the QA, but um, we do a lot on the uh, you know, on the on the ES on the e and S part as well as the governance part, but you know, here we've given you some idea about our short term and long term uh, focus. And uh, you know, again, I won't uh, I won't blaze through it. I'll let John speak to it a little bit, but it's very important. We are we are well aware of what's coming our way, and uh, you know, our management team is really focused on looking at the right investments to make incremental improvements. Uh, you know, as these changes come. Just quickly turning to, uh, to financial results, we just re released results for the quarter uh, ended December 31. We are a March 31 year end. Numbers are all there, but I would like to focus on uh, just a couple points on capital allocation, which we think are really critical. Um, you know, in the, since our IPO, we've returned over $300 million of cash uh, to our investors. And the vast majority of that has been since, uh, since 2019. Uh, we've done that through open market repurchases, but we've all, we also did a $113 million self-tender offer, uh, which was upsized from the original sort of 80 plus million that was planned, uh, given the demand. And then um, we've recently added dividends to our playbook. So uh, we've paid $2 a share in dividends recently. So that's $80 million in capital to uh, our shareholders uh, just in the last couple of quarters. So again, it remains a focus of our board and our management. And we think that uh, our actions, um, prove that for sure. And uh, you should continue to expect, you know, a good focus on, on capital allocation and shareholder returns. So, um, you know, we think from a, an investment perspective, 
Uh, we offer a lot. We've got great fundamentals in our market, um, good solid growth perspective, good pull through demand. Um, as a company, we believe we're well, very well capitalized. Um, you know, uh, manageable debt levels, no refinancings until 2025. Pretty low, pretty low interest rates. Uh, what we consider a best-in-class fleet in terms of our uh, fuel efficiency, as well as a very strong commercial operation that uh, we're able to run between uh, our, our team in Copenhagen and our joint venture partners in uh, Singapore, makes us one of the few truly global uh, providers in that regard, and we think it's a point of differentiation. And uh, you know, with that, I think I'll close our my remarks, and uh, we'll just. Uh, Give uh, we'll, we'll we'll give it a second for uh, for Q and A, and uh, we'll uh, we'll take it from there. So um, just give us a moment here. Uh, John, would you like to uh, just do a, a a a few minutes on on uh, on what we're doing from an ESG perspective? Uh, sure. Uh you 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 probably re refer to uh, generally the regulations and uh, the other uh, uh, matters that uh, are upon us uh, uh, regarding vessels preparations for uh, emissions is that what the question is yes all right okay uh, yeah we we uh, we we are been looking into the uh, energy efficiency of our vessels for the last uh, uh, two, three years while uh, we were installing scrubbers, uh, because we thought that uh, the per performance and the efficiency of those vessels, uh, uh, except uh, the scrubber uh, installation, was an important part of uh, the future, uh, always um, being more efficient, re reducing the consumption of fuel, and uh, the resulting emission uh, would always impact your uh, bottom line and your uh, operating costs. So I, as a result, uh, we feel that we have done a good, uh, good work in, in um, preparing for the um, upcoming EXI regulations and the uh, post-2023 CII uh, uh, um, index uh, uh, performance. So we we are uh, trying to uh, install on our vessels a number uh, of uh, uh, efficiency um, uh, devices. And these devices have been already implemented on many of our ships and will be done on more ships. And we believe that with those additional uh, features, the, the vessels will be able to easily um, uh, trade with uh, uh, with some uh, engine power limitation, but it's not going to be uh, significant e enough to affect their uh, trading ability into uh, the 2030s. Uh, thereafter, it is an open uh, game. Uh, we will have to look at uh, more uh, uh, improved uh, uh, efficiencies by using additional uh, measures. Uh, which are uh, well underway, including um, carbon capture and storage on board the ships, um, protecting um, uh, using batteries uh, to, to save some of the energy produced and uh, sometimes wasted, uh, uh, improving the engine uh, uh, by adding new features that are being uh, established by the, the manufacturers of the engine. And uh, uh, generally uh, trying to uh, uh, make sure that our, um, our vessels become future-proof. Uh, in, in a way, we have a, a long way to go uh, with these vessels. They are new, young vessels, and we feel that by uh, adding those uh, additional features in the future, we will be able to trade well into the 2040s, um, uh, at least in the, the late 2030s. Uh, and uh, um, so, that's generally um, our uh, take on, on, on that. And maybe, um, I don't know if there's any other questions on that. I, I, don't. I think that's, well, there is, there, you sort of touched on it, John. There, there is another question uh, from uh, our friends at Drewries who asked uh, do, whether we expect the useful life of, of LPG companies, I guess LPG tankers, to reduce in view of the new environmental regulations. 
Uh, he notes, we have some companies reducing useful life of their LPG vessels from 30 years to 25 years for depreciation purposes. Well, that's, 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 that's your client BW. Uh, we've, been we've been depreciating over 25 years since the beginning um, because we think anything over 25 years is bonus territory in terms of trading. But uh, John, do you want to comment? Because uh, you just touched on it that you think we can extend the trading life of the, you know, potentially extend the trading life of the vessels um, or Absolutely. at least be competitive for longer. Absolutely. Those uh, uh, the, the engines that those ships have are the aqua engines. They are very efficient ed engines. Uh, uh, they, they uh, uh, as, as of even yesterday, we were talking with a man, the manufacturer of those engines, and they do have a number of uh, 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 tools uh, in their toolbox that they have just started marketing, which will improve the efficiency of those engines and, uh, uh, and their um, uh, performance in, in consumption and lube oil um, uh, uh, consumption. So the, the, there are uh, a number of uh, ideas coming up and uh, um, uh, into uh, uh, fruition. And also, as I mentioned, uh, um, there, is, uh, there are a number of uh, ways besides, I mean, you know, improving the scrubber to add additionally capture carbon is one of the ways to reduce the footprint of the vessel. Uh, so uh, I think that will be become uh, probably a, a matter of course in the uh, latter part of this decade, and uh, it, it will make the, um, the it will enable most of the ship to trade into the 2030s, as I mentioned before. And uh, uh, there's uh, don't get me wrong, there's also fuels that you, you could uh, add to to to, to this discussion. Uh, so there is uh, um, the, 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 the more the emissions are um, uh, at focus and their, um, the emission uh, per ton of CO2 emitted becomes an expensive proposition, the more we will see uh, new technologies coming into effect in our ships and those ships can be converted. These are modern ships by any other way and uh, uh, we have not seen anything different uh, to make us believe that those ships have become antiquated in any way. Thanks, John. A um, couple other uh, questions. Um, uh, let's see here. So we had a question uh, from an investor in the Czech Republic um, asking about uh, sort of some of the economics around our revenue and uh, just to, to drill into that a little bit, um, again, as I talked about, there's really uh, three drivers. Um, one is the Baltic rate, which is the dollars per metric ton. Two is the bunker price and three is the utilization. And uh, we actually usually go through that in the management discussion analysis uh, portion of our filings. So we get a bit more detail there, but uh, for example, um, there was a question about the drop in revenue over year over year or quarter over the quarter just ended versus the prior period. And most of that had to do with uh, higher bunker prices. I mean, you know, the oil price was a lot higher in the last in, in the last quarter than it was in the quarter ended uh, December 31, 2020. And that and, and that translated into higher bunker prices, which translated into lower realized TCEs. You know, our, our utilization wasn't terribly different, uh, although it did contribute a little bit uh, did contribute a little bit for it uh, uh, to it. So again, there, there's some, there's a, there's a bit of, uh, there's a couple of different drivers that we do try to lay out in our, in our filings. Um, another question uh, concerning any interest we may have in expanding into the smaller LPG ship categories. Uh, I think at this point we're pretty happy where we're focused. Um, you know, if there were, um, we, we've, we've seen opportunities there again. Um, I think we'd want to be convinced that the returns on capital were at least as good as what we see, and uh, what uh, and you know that we would have a defensible niche of some sort. Otherwise, you know, there's really not any reason for us to to get into that. I think um, you know as we've looked at different parts of the sector, it is a bit different. Um, it's actually much harder business in some ways in terms of uh, you know simply being in and out of port multiple times a day. It's very tough on the hulls of the ships. And uh, you know it can it can it can even be tougher on the crew because uh, the shoreside operations can be quite labor intensive. So we're pretty happy with where we sit. But if an opportunity presents itself, uh, I'm sure we'd look at it. 
Um, another question, uh, John, if you want to touch on or I can do it, but uh, question uh, about the composition of the current order book. Is it our peers? Sure. Is it our traders? Uh, sure. You know, and uh, so if you want to go ahead, uh, feel free. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, um, th 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 there was a, a, a big move into ordering ships uh, towards uh, uh, in, in 2021. And the reason was the, the event of the dual fuel engine. It just came out and became commercially available in 2021. A lot of people thought this is the way uh, to go forward. Uh, the, the fleet had a low order book. And uh, in view of the uh, good growth in the LPG trade. Uh, uh, they uh, they believe that the uh, uh, you know the the new uh, the new engines the du new dual fuel engines would be uh, a, a great opportunity. So the orders have come from uh, yes from some uh, from traders. Uh, it have come from uh, uh, owners. Uh, it has come from uh, uh, peers like uh, like uh, people like you know uh, similarly to, to, to our uh, to our uh, kind of companies. Uh, but there's also come from leasing companies quite a lot and uh, some opportunistic uh, uh, orders. Mainly the bulk of the uh, of the order book has been from uh, um, uh, uh, leasing companies that, uh, uh, use these uh, ships to uh, list them out into uh, for further trading and replacing all the tonnage. It, it, it is it, it has, however, stopped um, since the end of last year. It's, it stands at uh, just below seventy ships, and uh, I think the, the the there has been no interest in ordering because prices have gone uh, sky high. And uh, uh, it just doesn't make a, a commercial sense to order ships at this kind of prices. And uh, we will we'll wait to see how um, uh, the market uh, develops in the next couple of years. These, most of these ships are gonna deliver in 2023, uh, so. And, and I'd say, I, I think I just added that, you know, these aren't really speculative orders. This isn't the sector where we've seen massive, uh, our secondhand market is unfortunately not quite as deep as some other sectors. So where you've got guys who've made, you know, huge profits speculating in container ships, dry bulkers, and of course, crude carriers, um, it really hasn't been the case so much in our sector. So most of the orders, uh, while there are some lease, there are leasing companies, like John said, they're, they're all contracted and they're all contracted mostly to guys like us. So we have one new building on order um, and we're, we're, we're doing it. Uh, as a bare boat lease with a Japanese owner. Um, but again, it's us. So in most cases, you know, we, we're not seeing new entrants. We're not seeing really speculative ordering activity. It's mostly the usual suspects at this point. Uh, so we're not seeing a significant shift in the composition of, of, the, of, the, of, the, uh, of our competitors. So that's, that's important to us. That's correct. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, another question concerning the evolution of our capital allocation strategy. Uh, this questioner notes that one analyst said that you went from being one of the least shareholder friendly companies to one of the most. Well, we didn't think we were that, ever that shareholder unfriendly, but um, you, know, you have to uh, amortize a bit of the ship and build up your, uh, build up your liquidity before you can start uh, you know, paying out cash in meaningful amounts like we have. And I think, um, if you look at the history of the company, we came public in, in 2014 um, with three ships on the water. And, uh, it, you know, we took delivery of the remainder of our ships through 2015. So we did enjoy some of the really good market, but unfortunately, we were a little bit on the late side. And then those of you who follow the sector will know that 2016, 17, and most of 18 were pretty rough uh, sledding uh, for our sector. And so during that time, we were pretty focused on paying down our debt, um, you know, making sure that we were uh, taking out costs where we could without sacrificing any of our quality. Um, and we, we did that, we think, quite successfully. We also were able to tap into some new financing sources. We had the benefit of terming out some of our debt, um, which also, it was, it was attractively priced. So we were able to, uh, you know, lower our interest cost in most cases. Uh, and lower our principal uh, amortization because of the longer tenor of the of the financings. So that gave us, you know, that that gave us, uh, frankly, a firmer financial footing, and it sort of enabled um, the groundwork 
to pay the dividends and do the, the, the self tender offer that we did because um, you know the the you know we weren't spending as quite as much on on uh, principal and interest and then of course the markets were quite favorable so you know we think that's what our investors are, are you know absolutely deserve to expect that when the market's good um, we should be able to uh, to share those profits in cash. Um, you know, some have noted. Well, you know, you started out with open market repurchases, then you then you evolved to the self tender offer, and now you did a you've done dividends, but then you just announced a hundred million dollar share repurchase. You know, is, is there a certain bias here? What's going on? And and I think I'd tell you that um, uh, you know we, we we like to have all the arrows in our quiver. Um, you know, we think we've received pretty much universally positive feedback on on our dividends because. Who doesn't like a dollar per share in his pocket? Um, you know, we, we, we certainly as management do. Um, you know, the self-tender offer we think was, was interesting because it did give uh, an opportunity for some folks who might've wanted to uh, get out at that point, a really easy way given the, you know, our liquidity in our stock to get out of big positions, it's, it's kind of hard. So we think that was good. You know, the recent uh, $100 million share repurchase authorization it's really just a reloading of what we had before. Um, and I think, you know, we will, we will use it opportunistically. I think it's fair to say that um, the market has a hard time ascribing a lot of value to opportunistic open market share repurchases and a somewhat easier time ascribing value to dividends, even if they're irregular as ours are. So um, I think we're gonna, you know, figure out where we think the best return is for our shareholders. And that's where you'll see us putting our, uh, our additional cash. Um, as it uh, as it comes free, um, I think um, yeah, I think at this point we've we've kind of uh, answered the questions, and we're pretty much at the end of uh, at the end of the time slot. So we can see if there are any more questions. But I think it uh, looks like we're we've we've covered it all. Uh, so with that, uh, Nicholas, should we turn it back to you? Well, you did answer all the questions. Uh, we have quite a few of them. Thank you very, very much to both, uh, both of you, John and Ted, for joining us today. Uh, it has been a very well-prepared presentation and uh, thanks for uh, addressing all the questions. Uh, as a reminder, this presentation will be available uh, for replay access. Um, if uh, our current uh, uh, delegates or others would like to access it later on. Again, thank you very, very much for joining us. Thank today. you, Nicholas. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you. For thank you very much. And thank you for everyone for attending. Thank you.